Please turn to John 11, and I have a confession to make, which is that my sermon preparation was interrupted yesterday, as I suspect your life was interrupted as well by the events that happened in Butler, Pennsylvania. And it was sad, really sad, and reminds me of how much we need the grace of God. For those of you that lived through the tumultuous 1960s, uh, I'm sure it brought back very painful memories for you as it did for me. Roughly 160 years ago, Abraham Lincoln spoke about our country and he said, we've been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We've been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power, but we have forgotten God. Two weeks ago, I told you that Kristen and I had been watching the Netflix series entitled The Nuremberg Trials, uh, 1945 to 46. As those trials concluded, each defendant was allowed to make a statement and there was one in particular that really caught my ear, Hans Frank, Hitler's governor general of occupied Poland, said this, we, the Nazis, did not suspect that our turning away from God could have such disastrous and deadly consequences. Yesterday, I think we were reminded of what happens when people forget God and turn their backs on God. It's anarchy. And every man does that which is right in his own eyes. We forget God, we forget to love our neighbors ourselves. We forget God, we forget to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So while laws are good and right and necessary, no law has ever or will ever change the heart of a human being. Only Jesus does that. And he does that through his word and through his people. Hence the importance of the church to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning, reminded of the strategic role of the Church of Jesus Christ, to proclaim Him, to lift Him up, to lift high the cross and boast in that cross. Lord God, you've given us this good land and have blessed us with the choicest bounties of heaven, and you have preserved us in peace and prosperity. So save us from ourselves. Save us from violence and discord and confusion. And be pleased, we pray, by your grace to bless us with godly, humble leaders. And use your church to be indeed the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That one day soon the lion and the lamb will lay down together. And the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Bless our time of worship and the reading and hearing and exposition of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> At this point in the uh, narrative of John, many of you, most of you have been here for uh, this series, but perhaps today's your first time. And I will just uh, say that by this point in the narrative, uh, Jesus has performed enough miracles to impress his followers and to antagonize his enemies, particularly the religious leadership who have resolved several times over to take his life. And yet in spite of all the miracles that he's performed to this point, none will compare, none are as stupendous as the one that he will perform in this 11th chapter. Some of you, probably a few of you are aware that uh, I was out last week with uh, conjunctivitis, both eyes. Um, we went out to dinner July the 4th, 
and uh, in Brentwood, and we came outside. A terrific wind blew for about 10 minutes, and uh, debris got into my eyes, and uh, a day or two later, my eyes were very unhappy, and they were red and watery and somewhat painful and so forth. Of course, the good news for those of you that don't know this is that our church is full of experts. <laughs> we have a lot of chiefs, not too many Indians, but a lot of chiefs. And so one of our chief experts said, Jim, what you need to do is go to conjunctivitis.com. <laughs> I said, what is conjunctivitis.com? And I was told it's a site for sore eyes. <laughs> mm. I'm glad you laughed, I didn't. <laughs> but I did resolve to share that with you since I have a reputation for bad jokes that I need to maintain. So, been a while since I told one. Here in John 11, we are introduced to a man who is sick. It's no fun to be sick. His name was Lazarus. His case was far worse than conjunctivitis. His sisters were concerned about him, and as we read on in the narrative, we find that they had very good reason to be concerned about him. And if conjunctivitis.com is a site for sore eyes, John 11, 1 through 6 is a site for bad theology on display. First of all, they misunderstood the illness. Verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness did not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. I don't know that we think of our illness as a means for God to be glorified when we're sick. My guess is we think about germs, we think about bacteria, we think about viruses. We may think God's mad at us. But I don't know that we see any way for God to be glorified through our illness or affliction or trial of whatever sort it may be. And in fairness, it's easy to understand why Jesus said what he said here. He knew the rest of the story, didn't he? He knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to perform an incredible miracle. And he knew he would do it in order to validate his, further validate his claim to be the Messiah. But he doesn't seem to work so dramatically in our lives, does he? We don't get a miracle. We get a doctor. We get an antibiotic. And uh, we get well, hopefully, most of the time. Sometimes we don't. So how, how can we see the glory of God? How can he be glorified through our suffering, our illnesses? We have to learn to think differently. Uh, let me remind you of the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, which you're probably not familiar with. But it's a great catechism written a long time ago by the German Reformed Church addressing the subject of the providence of God, saying that God upholds heaven and earth and all creatures so that leaves and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and unfruitful years, riches and poverty, sickness and health, Come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Sickness, poverty, unfruitful years. Come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. And there's another line in the Heidelberg Catechism you may remember because we use it from time to time. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Question number one. Answer that I belong body and soul not to myself but to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say that not one single hair can fall from our heads without the will of our Father in heaven. So how is God glorified when we suffer? How does God get glory from our 
travail. He gets glory when we trust him, whether we're abounding or abased, whether we're healthy or sick. He gets glory when we have confidence that he does all things well and that all these things that he does are for our good. Romans 8, 28, we may not see it at the moment, we generally don't, but we trust him, we have confidence. He gets glory when we say with Job, though he slay me, I will trust him. He gets glory when we, when we say with a psalmist, and these were some of my father's last words before he passed away recently, eyes shut. He quoted the psalmist, my times are in his hands. My times are in his hands. These things don't come to us by chance or by fate, but by his fatherly hand. I, I noticed in the bulletin that our Tuesday morning men's group is going to be studying the book of Acts using a commentary by James Montgomery Boyce. I had lunch with Dr. Boyce many years ago. I was just a little neophyte. Uh, I think I, I was a year or two in the ministry. And Dr. Boyce was there with one other gentleman. They were giants. And I know you find this hard to believe, but I bet I didn't say two words at lunch that day. <laughs> I just listened. It was a wonderful time. And then some years later, I remember how, how saddened and surprised I was when uh, Jim Boyce, at the young age of 61, which looks younger all the time, uh, came down with cancer. And he announced his cancer at a Good Friday service. And immediately, the cards and letters and calls and various forms of communication came in to Dr. Boyce saying, don't worry, we're praying for you. God's going to do a miracle. You're going to be fine, et cetera, et cetera. But he was a wise man. And he responded publicly by saying this, should you pray for a miracle? Well, you're free to do that, of course. My general impression is that the God who is able, able to perform miracles, and he certainly can, is also able to keep you from getting the problem in the first place. Above all, I would say, pray for the glory of God. If you think of God glorifying himself in history, and you say, where in all history has God most glorified himself? The answer is that he did it at the cross of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't by delivering Jesus from the cross, though he could have. Eight weeks after his diagnosis, he passed away. But he glorified God every step of the way. They misunderstood the illness Secondly, they misunderstood the love of Jesus. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Very matter of fact, and we don't read verses like this often in the Bible. Jesus loved them. John wants to make sure we know he really loved these people. In fact, his love for Lazarus was so obvious that when the two sisters sent word to their brother, or excuse me, sent word to the Lord Jesus Christ about their brother. They didn't call him by name. You notice verse 3, so the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. <laughs> and Jesus knew immediately who they were talking about. Now, Jesus loved a lot of people, I'm sure, but there was something outstanding about his love for Lazarus. Something exceptional. Maybe they were the very best friends. And so John wants to be sure we know that there's no doubt about the love of Jesus for Lazarus. So therefore, because he loved Lazarus so much, he should have healed him. Right? Isn't that what you're supposed to do when if you've got a friend that you love and, and that friend's in need? You do everything you can to fix the problem. Uh, what, what good is love if you just sort of look the other way? The sisters were thinking that Jesus should drop what he was doing and make a beeline to Bethany 
and solve this problem. They knew he had the power to do it. They knew or thought they knew that he loved Lazarus. And so surely when they sent word, Jesus would respond. They had it all figured out. Everything would be fine. Jesus would come and heal Lazarus. There's one little problem. His ways are not our ways. Nor his thoughts our thoughts. His ways are way above our ways. And very often we misunderstand what we might call the tough love of Jesus. You think about other stories in the Bible. Did Jesus, did God stop loving Joseph, for example, when Joseph was sold into slavery? What did Joseph think? Sold into slavery, thrown into prison? Is that the way God loves people? Is that how he shows his love? Did God stop loving the Israelites when uh, all their little boys were thrown in the Nile River and drowned? I mentioned Job earlier. Did, did God stop loving Job when Job lost everything? You think you have a bad day every now and then. He really had a bad day. The fact of the matter is we cannot discern divine love by the circumstances of life at this or that particular moment, can we? We discern divine love by the divine word, which tells us he loves us. And that love is from everlasting to everlasting. And it's a saving love and it's a sanctifying love. That's where the tough love comes in. And it's a love from which we can never be separated, not even death, Paul says in Romans 8, can separate us from the love of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if I may use the words that we sung a moment ago from William Cooper, behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Do you notice those words? Do you know there's some speculation that Cooper wrote that hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, after a failed suicide attempt? We don't know for sure. But we do know he spent 18 months in a mental institution. Had, had God stopped loving him? It was in that mental institution that he was converted. And after his conversion and release, he became friends with John Newton. And the two of them worked on hymns together. And William Cooper went on to become a great poet, regarded as the famous, greatest poet uh, of his day. So just think how the church of Jesus Christ has been blessed for years by a man who was converted in a mental institution. We so often misunderstand the love of Jesus because we're looking at it through the circumstances of life and sometimes those circumstances are adverse. They misunderstood the illness. They misunderstood the love of Jesus. And they certainly misunderstood the timing of things here. Verse, uh, verse 6. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Two days longer. I believe it was Tim Cummings' father who used to say to me often that God's timing is always perfect, but he sure does miss a lot of opportunities to be early. Oh, how these ladies wanted Jesus to be early. So much they wanted him to be early. And they, of course they thought he was late according to their timetable. And later we're going to see as we move through the chapter how they complain to Jesus. Jesus, if, if you had been here, our brother would not have died Translation, it's your fault. You blew it. We thought you loved our brother. But on the contrary, this is important. 
It was precisely because he did love Lazarus that he delayed two days and brought those two ladies into this state of despair. Because it was through this despair, this despair was going to be the means by which he would bring them to a greater happiness and an even stronger faith. So only by letting Lazarus die was Jesus able to show the full extent of his love and his omnipotence and his sovereignty and his great salvation. But at this moment in time, the ladies couldn't see a bit of that. All they could see through their tears was gloom and doom and despair and misery. About four years ago, Kristen and I went to Nevada shortly before Christmas for William and Solana Taylor's wedding. It was an eventful trip. Uh, about 15 minutes into the flight, I got really sick again. And it was COVID had just sort of emerged and I was wearing one of those masks and I don't know what I did wrong or what, how it happened, but we were up there at 30,000 feet and I didn't feel good. And my head was light. I even looked at Kristen and said, help me. Now, I thought, I've got COVID and I'm doggone, I'm gonna be the fastest COVID death in history. I'm not even gonna <laughs> be able to fight this thing for long. And the stewardesses were making a fuss over me, and finally one said, take your mask off, put your head down between your legs, and guess what? By the time the flight landed, I was fine. So then we got our, uh, our rental car, and we decided to go to Lake Tahoe for two days. We'd never been there. So we thought we'd go there for a couple of days of R&R before the wedding. Then we got, on, got the car out of the garage and onto the interstate and driving along and take the exit, and. Pretty soon we're going up a windy two-lane road up to the mountain and snowing. And uh, the higher we went, the harder it was snowing. And, and these cars were flying down the other side. And the road started to get covered. And it was dark. It was after sunset when we landed. So it was already dark, but it was really dark. And the, the farther up we went, the darker it got. And I finally said, Kristen, I can't see a thing. Actually, I might have said a bad word, a bad adjective right before the word thing, but I, I am a sinner. I was, I was uptight, and she was really, really over there uptight. <laughs> we finally found a place to pull off, and she jumped out and ran up to the front of the car and came back in and said, I know what the problem is. You didn't turn the headlights on. <laughs> that is the problem. No wonder it's so doggone dark. But um, in defense of myself, I have a car that, where the lights come on automatically. <laughs> Do you have one of those? And when we were in the garage, there were great lights in that garage. And, uh, and I, I assumed the car light, the headlights were on, and, and the interstate was very well lit, and the exit was very well lit, and once till we, until we started going up that we saw in a mirror very dimly just like these ladies saw in a mirror very dimly. They, they surveyed the landscape. They said, look here, Lazarus got sick, number one. Number two, Lazarus died. Number three, Jesus didn't show up. Jesus was on trial. And Jesus was guilty. That was their conclusion. I like what Sheldon Van Auken once said the author of uh, A Severe Mercy, he said, sometimes God seems to play fast and loose with us just as, it, as the adult seems to mislead the child and the master seems to mislead the dog, but they misread the signs. Their ignorance and their wishes twist everything. And you see these ladies were, ladies were so fixated on getting Lazarus healed Little did they know how much ecstasy, elation, to use that word the choir sang this morning, how much excitement was just moments away for them because they misread the signs. 
But the Lord held their darkness in his hands, just like he does ours. And he makes very good use of that darkness. Sometimes he wants to produce a sweeter spirit or a softer heart or a greater sympathy for others or a more humble mind. We really don't know what he's up to, but we know it's good, whatever he's up to. And we know the principle is always true that while sorrow may remain for the night, and sometimes it's a very long night, joy always comes in the morning. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this truth and uh, for your sovereignty and your grace and your love. Forgive us for so often misreading the signs. And may you get glory from our lives, whether we abound or abased, whether we are rich or poor or healthy or sick. And may you sanctify to us all of our deep distresses and produce the fruit of the Spirit that, that you would so uh, desire. We give thanks that your word never returns void and always bears fruit in our lives. And so uh, use us, we pray, and sanctify us and grow us, increase our faith and our trust and our confidence that you do all things well and all things work together for our good. Bless those that are sick among us, some recovering from surgery, some facing surgery, others in therapy. We think of Ron Hamilton and Solana Taylor. We pray for Lynn Bennett and Martha Woods as they grieve the loss of dear loved ones. For Debbie Kinney, that you might strengthen her and bless her, and Don Birdwell, Mike Bishop, uh, Charlie Smith, Landy Campbell, we thank you for Edna Smith's presence with us today and pray that you would continue to strengthen her. And again, bless our country, Lord. God bless America. God shed your grace on us and bring a great revival that you may receive glory and on, honor and majesty and dominion through Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.